valley in a kind of S-curve, while the Australians were across the river on a similar but lower hill. As we moved onto the heights, we could see the Republic of Korea units in full retreat below us, rolling south down the gravel road in their nice new American trucks. The retreat went on for hours, while we dug in, and it wasn't all that encouraging. I'm here defending these people, and they're running one way while I'm going the other. What in the hell is this? They're rolling out like the bank staff going home at five. Sergeant Andrew Lewis, Princess Patricia's Canadian Light Infantry. A young Canadian lieutenant had a different perspective on the South Koreans. Those guys are precious now. If they get wiped out, we're here forever. Let them live to fight another day. Or at least to be here when the fighting's over so we can go home. Looking north into the last rays of the setting sun, Colonel Stone and the Canadians could see the tail end of the South Korean Army's route, the stretch of empty road behind them, and then the first fleet Chinese foot soldiers darting along the ridge tops, with thousands more pouring like ants over the hills and the valleys beyond. Darkness descended. The Canadians dug in, watched, peering out at nothing, expectantly, apprehensively. They knew from the scene at sunset that they were vastly outnumbered. We just sat out in the trenches, silent, listening, looking for the first move, the first contact with the enemy. Suddenly, there was a distant pop. Seconds later, a flare dangles from a little parachute lighting up the Australian position across the river. Now we could see the enemy swarming across the paddy fields. Small arms fire started immediately, punctuated with grenades exploding and poof, crump of mortars. It's like watching a football game from the bleachers. All night long, we just sat and watched the battle across the river. At dawn, the Aussies were still in place, but were being clobbered with wave after wave of communist troops, some of them advancing into the raw, direct fire of supporting tanks and machine guns. It was awesome. Stone and his officers listened in on Aussie radio communication. One after another, they learned of Australian units being overrun. Finally, as darkness approached, with their communications gone, command post overrun, supplies running low and casualties mounting, the Australians were told to withdraw. As soon as the Australians began to pull out, the attack transferred across the river to us. First, there was a loud bugle call from out there in the darkness, then the sound of thousands of sticks being beaten together. And as the first soldier materialized out of the murk, there came screaming and shouting and the piercing sound of shrill whistles as they came through the brush towards us. Within seconds, they were less than 50 feet away. The darkness was soon filled with curses, screams, brain gun chatter, prayers, acrid smoke, flashes of flame, and shouted warnings. Jim Wainity. Bruce McDonald of Peterborough and Wayne Mitchell, another Princess Pat, had set up their Vickers machine gun to cover the easiest approach to the hill. The Chinese attacked and overran their position. Wayne Mitchell was number one on the Bren. I was number two. When we were overrun, he was hit by shrapnel, but he never gave up his gun. For the rest of the night, we sat there and held them off for as long as we could. I don't know how long we were there before we got the order to move out. I had three shells left, so I dropped back and fired them off. Just as I jumped up, I fell over a Chinaman who was running up the side of a hill. He got me in the neck and then ran into the end of my bayonet. I was swung completely around. When I got my bearings, I started back. I went as far as I could, then got weak and lay down. I tried to see, but I couldn't, so I crawled back. I was afraid they would shoot me, so I kept hollering. Mitchell recognized my voice and came out. Soon I saw him. He told me, you got him. Your rifle was still in him. The commander of D Company was J.G.W. Wally Mills. His position was somewhat north and west of the others and was perhaps the most exposed on the hill. During the evening and on into the night, hundreds of Chinese moved up, completely surrounding Captain Mills and his men. Then, in savage and desperate hand fighting, they moved over the entire area the Canadians were defending. To Mills and those around him, there seemed no hope. Wally Mills called me and said the Chinese had infiltrated and overrun his position. He wanted to pull out. 
I told him to stay there, that nobody could pull out. If we ever lose this hill, we lose all, I told him. Then, will you fire artillery right on top of my position? Are you dug in, I asked. When he said he was, I told him to keep his head down and get ready. I got in touch with the artillery and our own mortars, and we fired right where he was in the wooded area. He didn't have a single man wounded, but it certainly got rid of the Chinese around him. Colonel Jim Stone, 2nd Battalion, Princess Patricia's Canadian Light Infantry. Captain Wally Mills was awarded the Military Cross for his actions that night, and Private Wayne Mitchell, who had shared the gun with Bruce MacDonald, received the Distinguished Conduct Medal. As the night wore on, fears that the Patricias would be annihilated gradually subsided. Our supply route had been cut, and I had no way of knowing how long we might have to hold our position or how aggressive the enemy might become. We were pretty well out of food, water, and ammunition. At around 4 a.m., I called for an airdrop from Japan. We ordered what we wanted, and sure enough, six hours later, four C-119s dropped by parachute everything we requested, including mortar ammunition. It was the most beautiful sight I can ever remember seeing. I was so hungry, my stomach was in knots. Then all of a sudden, down came those big flying boxcars. I made a pass, and then they came back and made the drop. It was tremendous. The Canadians braced themselves for more attacks the following night, but the Chinese offensive never resumed. Cap Yong was the deepest the Chinese would ever penetrate into South Korea. Cap Yong wasn't the biggest battle in history, but it was well planned and well fought. We were surrounded by the enemy. We could have run, or panicked in some way, or surrendered. We stayed, fought, and held and then withdrew in a soldierly fashion. Colonel Jim Stone, 2nd Battalion, Princess Patricia's Canadian Light Infantry. The Patricias learned that their American predecessors bedded down and posted a solitary sentry instead of digging in and maintaining a proper watch. Bill Boss, Canadian press correspondent. On their way to Cap Yong, the Princess Pats had stumbled onto a story the Americans didn't want told. Coming around a bend in the trail, the lead man shouted to freeze. Hell, I was already frozen. But now I stopped moving. He'd spotted a booby trap down the path ahead of us. Just a little trip, an old piece of signal wire stretched out across the path where your boot would catch it. He rigged it from a distance and blew it up. And the explosion launched a dead man's body into the air. We moved further, cautiously, and found bodies of 65 black GIs in their sleeping bags where they'd gone to sleep the night before. We'd been hearing stories of how MacArthur had sent all his officers and men from the U.S. occupation force in Japan over to Korea without any combat training. And here was a whole bunch of them who never would be trained, killed while still zipped up in their sleeping bags in long johns and pajamas. They hadn't even dug in for the night, but were caught sleeping on top of the frozen ground, waiting to be killed. They were just slaughtered in their sleep underwear. More than half their bodies were still in sleeping bags, bayoneted to death. I put my stuff down, took out my writing pad, and began to write a farewell letter to my mother. Dear Mom, I'm here amongst dead people, eating lunch. I saw dead people up in the hills at Muryang, the gorillas, but these are our own. This is war. It's the biggest shock of my life. I don't know if I'm going to make it. Look at these guys. What chance have we got? Private Don Hibbs, Princess Pats. I came across a couple of them in a trench. It was cold, and we used to do this too. Put straw in a trench to keep warm. The trench had been set on fire, and the two guys were burned right up. Private Harley Welsh. Colonel Jim Stone noted that the Princess Pats, after encountering the dead Americans, ceased to get in their sleeping bags, simply lying underneath them for warmth, but never covering their heads as the US recruits had done. As a precaution, he issued an order that the troops were never to raise the hoods in their parkas while in the vicinity of the enemy. The order didn't need to be explained. 
The world was not supposed to know about the American massacre, but Canadians read about it 